And welcome to the fabulous Red Balloon Bookshop. Excellent. Welcome, front row sitting yes. person. 100 <laughs> points Yay. to this young person. Thank you so much. Um, welcome to Red Balloon Bookshop here in fabulous St. Paul, Minnesota, where it's really cold, but it's still not a blizzard. So we're having a great author event tonight. Uh, my name is Angela Whited. I am the events coordinator here at Red Balloon. So I try to plan all the fun shenanigans that we like to keep happening. I'm so pleased to welcome um, the author of the best, the two probably best-selling books of Hannah Kahn's here in our store would be Amina's Voice, which is a Maud Hart Lovelace title, and also It's Ramadan, Curious oh, George, yes. a rock star <laughs> hit every story time, every time it can be seen. Uh -huh. um, here tonight for this adorable new book, more oh, to the story. You. Let's give a great big warm welcome to thank Hannah Thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone thank you so much for coming out um, um, hopefully you'll love this book too um, and it makes me really I'm so happy about um, Amina I say Amina actually and then people hear me and they're like ah, I've been saying Amina but um, I actually took out a part in the book during edits where she said the way people mispronounced her name and how she says it and I don't know why I took it out because it creates this this <laughs> situation and I almost thought should I say Amina too? It'll make people, you know, <laughs> but I, in my head she's Amina and I can't switch and that's the Pakistani way of pronouncing it. So um, I'm actually working on a sequel to that book right now. So I'm in, yay, thank you for that. Um, so it's, um, I'm in the revision stage right now and we're trying to figure out a good pub date. It might, we were thinking next fall, but next fall seems like maybe not the best time for publishing a book. Um, so we're ma thinking maybe the following spring. So <laughs> um, yeah, so but in the meantime, hopefully you can enjoy this one, which is a book that is really um, dear to me for many reasons. Um, I will tell you what I, what I give away at the, end of the, at the end of the book and the acknowledgments. And I guess a lot of the advertising around the book mentions this too, that it's inspired by Little Women, which was uh, my all-time favorite book. Hi, welcome. Um, my all-time favorite book when I was growing up. Um, I was a huge rereader of books, and that was one that we had at home, and it belonged to my sister, and it was this thick because it was little women on one side, and when you flipped the book over, it had little men on the other. Have you seen that version? Yeah, yeah and so <laughs> I just, I don't know why, it might have been a challenge to see if I could read a book that thick, um, but once I did read it, I just fell in love, and and I, I, it's strange because I look back now, I'm like, why did I love this book so much, you know, and I read all sorts of other books I connected with too, but for some reason that was the one I kept going back to. And much later I had to, um, well, I, was, I was judging this contest um, by a, our DC Public Library system, and it was Letters and Literature it was called, and they were doing a celebration uh, for the kids who won um, the entries that would be submitted nationally. And they wrote letters to authors, dead or alive, who, have you, have you heard of this? Yeah. Thing. Oh, okay, yeah, and so and, and why their books mean so much to them. And so when I was going to be talking with these kids, I thought about who would I write to and what would I say. And that's when I realized I would probably write to Louise. I mean, I all caught about how much I loved her book, but I actually started thinking about like what was it that made me connect so much. Um, and I realized that when I was growing up as somebody who was a Pakistani American Muslim who didn't have any representation in the literature. Um, I think that was sort of the closest I got in many ways, and which is strange to think about a, a book that was written 150 years ago, <laughs> but some of the norms and some of the attitudes and some of the customs of the times were actually pretty familiar to me as somebody growing up you know, with the culture that my parents brought with them. So things around modesty and um, you know, respect for parents and um, even dating norms or not lack of dating <laughs> norms and marriage proposals and all that stuff was sort of comforting and familiar to me. So um, I thought about that and then that's where I got the idea. I thought it would be so cool to write a Pakistani American version of this book that I love so much. And I thought it would maybe be an actual retelling, you know, keeping the storyline pretty similar, um, you know, having things like the marriage proposals and, and so on. Um, I thought my Joe character would be around 16 and, and, and so on, and then her older sister could maybe be, you know, all that stuff. But when I actually started writing, um, I told my editor the idea and I said, okay, but the things I really hated about Little Women can't happen. Um, and I said, you know, 
Joe can't marry the old guy. And I was like, right? Like, that was the worst. And I said, and you know, Beth can't die. But, um, and so she liked the idea too. But when I actually sat down to start writing, I realized I didn't actually want to rewrite someone else's story. And, um, and that book is massive. And it ha takes place over so many years in these girls' lives. And it's each girl in the story gets sort of equal attention, even though Joe, I think, is favored. Um, and I was always most interested in Joe and her stories. I, she was the person I connected with the most, I think, because she was the one who was pushing against norms and wanting more for herself than society was really allowing for her at the time. And, uh, and so what I decided to do was age the book down. And um, I actually started writing it as a, as a YA, with Joe being 16. And I came up with Jamila as my protagonist. Um, and then I just I didn't feel it. I didn't connect with the character myself. And I thought, that's a problem <laughs> if you're trying to write a book and you don't even like the character. Um, and then I just realized I wanted to uh, really stay in the middle grade space. And so I had to go back and redo my outline and figure out, well, now what? And what I ended up with was a story that uh, is what I call a love letter to my favorite book. So I have elements that I've taken from the classic. And I didn't actually pick it up or touch it during the time that I was thinking about this. So it's really just things that stood out from my memory um, and elements of the story that I wanted to include. Um, so I have four sisters as well. And each of their names begin with the same letter as the girls in the classic book. So my main character is Jamila. And her friends call her, and her family call her Jam for short. Um, her eldest sister, Mariam, which would be the Meg equivalent for those of you who read Little Women. Um, Bisma is the third eldest, and or sorry, the third in order, and Eliza, the youngest. Um, and so J Jamila, and they're, they're a Pakistani American Muslim family living in contemporary Atlanta, um, and uh, this close but you know flawed family like most people's are <laughs> um, and Jamila is an aspiring writer she's uh, a journalist writing for her school newspaper she does feel a bit held back by her editor who wants to stick to very school focused topics things like um, you know, should the street s sign out front be a stoplight instead, or you know, school spirit, or the mascot, or things like that? And Jamila really wants hard-hitting news and bigger issues. Her grandfather was an award-winning journalist, and so she wants to follow in his footsteps. Jamila, like Joe and like me personally, uh, struggles a bit with a quick temper, um, and that was something I connected with when I was, I think, also a fan of Little Women. She also writes a family newspaper, something I did as a kid as well. Um, and she befriends Ali, a boy who moves from London to live with his uncle and aunt um, after his father has passed away. Uh, and his mother and younger sister will follow, but he came early to get settled in school. Um, Mariam is the eldest of the four. She uh, is a bit of a motherly, t motherly type. She takes care of everyone being the eldest. She loves to bake. And a lot of the recipes she makes are things I make in, in real life. I like to bake, too. Um, she's also a beauty who play pays a lot of attention to her looks, YouTube tutorials on makeup and hair and stuff like that. Um, Jamila's not like that, so she doesn't really get it. Um, Bisma's the the musical one who's very sweet. One reviewer called her human sunshine and sort of the peacemaker and the one who wants everyone to get along. And poor Eliza is the youngest, the one who Jamila calls a brat, um, but really I feel like is just sort of misunderstood, um, although she does tend to want what she wants and um, you know go after getting what she wants. <laughs> so she may deserve that reputation a little bit. Um, and it's funny, because when I was growing up, I always wanted to be Joe, like I said. But I think if you asked my older sister, she would probably say I was a lot like the youngest. Um, and, and now I can see it, how I probably actually was more than I care to admit. So I actually have a soft spot for Eliza for being the way she is. Um, and part of it is just being the youngest and, and wanting to be able to do what your older sisters are doing. Um, and so as I mentioned, um, Ali is the, the mysterious friend who moves in um, nearby, and um, he's actually British. And I don't know why I decided to pick a British person when I came up with the character, but somehow I went with that. And when I wrote my draft, um, you know, I just wrote my dialogue the way I would you know, 
imagine it. Uh, and then I thought about it and I was like, I don't think this character sounds British at all. <laughs> I think he sounds really American. Um, so I actually had a consultant, a friend of mine, whose nephew is a teenage British boy living in London. And so we had Skype calls. And I actually read my dialogue to him. And he corrected it um, and was like, yeah. And so I'm going to actually read you a passage, and I'll tell you what he corrected um, for me. But this is when they have first met um, Ali. And the book begins on Eid, the Eid holiday. And the girls are kind of disappointed that their father's away on a job interview um, on, on the holiday, which you know, that feels unjust. Um, but they've just met Ali. Um, who's come with his uncle and aunt, and they're sitting around the table. How do you like Atlanta, Ali? Mama asks when we're crammed around the dining table. Everyone's plates and bowls are filled with the traditional Pakistani treats that my mother serves on Eid, along with other favorites my sister and I have added over the years. It's pretty good, Ali po answers politely after he polishes off his fifth or sixth samosa. I try not to stare at how much he's eating or fixate on Ali's mouth while he speaks. I know that Desi people can have British accents, and that there are tons of people who immigrated at some point from India and Pakistan living in the United Kingdom, but I haven't met any of them before, and Ali's voice doesn't seem to match his face. There's a cupcake sitting on my plate, and I slowly unwrap it from the paper, thinking this Eid might be getting better after all. Then, as I bite into the buttery cake, a glob of toffee icing falls into my lap. It leaves a greasy smear mark on the green silk of my new outfit when I try to wipe it off. I look up, but no one noticed except for Ali, who hides his mouth behind his napkin and raises an eyebrow ever so slightly. Were you born in England, Elisa asks. She's hanging on Ali's every word and seems to have forgotten about sulking and the party we're missing as she grills him. Ah, uh, yes, born and bred. Why'd you come here by yourself, she presses. Ali shifts in his seat, and I see Mama give Elisa a signal that means, don't be nosy. My mom's finishing up work and selling our house. I'm here so I, I can't do a British accent, so I'm not going to try. Um, I'm here so I can, I tried actually once, and it came out sounding like a Desi, like a Pakistani accent, so it's totally off. Um, I'm here so I can begin school on time, Ali replies. He pauses for a moment before continuing. My father died last year, and we're moving here to be near my uncle and auntie. Oh, Aliza frowns and drops her head. We were so sorry to hear of your father's passing, Mama interjects. She reaches over the table and pats Ali's hand. It was a huge loss for your uncle, and I know for you. Thank you, Ali nods, but his eyes seem darker than before. I swallow hard remembering when Uncle Said's younger brother passed away unexpectedly. Mama took massive amounts of food to their house to feed the crowds of people offering condolences. When I went over, I saw Uncle Said cry so intensely his shoulder shook, even though he made no sound. The image of his grief haunted me for days. It feels weird to connect that moment to Ali months later, realize I don't know any details of how or why his father died, and imagine how Ali must feel. I'm sorry Fasil isn't here, Uncle Said changes the subject and brings up my father. He had a meeting that couldn't be rescheduled, Mama explains. We understand, but how terrible for him to have to miss eat. Auntie pours herself a piping hot cup of tea, despite the fact that she was just complaining again about the weather. It doesn't matter that we're in the South. My parents and their friends aren't ever going to switch drinking, from drinking chai to my favorite thing about living in Georgia, extra sweet tea with lots of ice. We know how it is, Uncle Said adds. Don't worry. Mama's definitely worried, because her lips are pressed together like they are when she's anxious. But she doesn't say anything else to explain why Baba's meeting is important enough for him to be away. The truth is, there's no way Baba would normally let work get in the way of celebrating Eid. But a few weeks ago, the contract he was working on for over two years at the Centers for Disease Control ended without any warning. That's why he doesn't have any work right now. And that's why he flew to Maryland to explore what he called a new opportunity. Do you have to go, my sisters and I whined in a chorus when we heard the news? No one would schedule, schedule meetings on Christmas, I argued. Eid is like Christmas. It's no fair. Baba shrugged, jokingly asked me not to write letters to the editor to protest the unfairness of his interview date and promised to be gone only for a night. I study my mother's face while she tries to act like everything's fine. I know it's an act because I've overheard my parents discussing money and how we'll need to make major changes if Baba doesn't find a new job soon. I have no idea what those are, but Mama already took extra shifts at the physical therapy practice where she works as an office manager. Since there's no sweet tea, I pour myself a cup of chai and take a careful sip. Blech, it's bland. Can you pass the sugar? I point to the sugar bowl in front of Ali. Please? 
How much? He uncovers the bowl for me. Three, I say. Jam likes tea with her sugar, Mama explains. Bad for your teeth. Uncle Say jumps at the chance to offer free dental advice. He's a dentist. Did you know some people hold a sugar cube in their teeth as they sip tea? Terrible idea. Ali hesitates, not sure what to do, but I push my cup forward. He obliges me and drops three heaping spoons of sugar into my teacup. Thanks. As the sugar dissolves, I feel everyone watching us, and warmth fills my cheeks. It might be the steam from the tea that's making me flushed again, or the fear of cavities after Uncle Sade's warning, or maybe it's the way Ali's looking at me. So this is, he, he corrected me from like, <clears throat> excuse me, born and bred, <coughs> um, which is, I, got, I had said born and raised, and so I guess he would say bread. But the big change was when I had him passing the tea, uh, sorry, passing the sugar for the tea, and she, he asked in my original version, how many lumps? Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. From Looney Tunes? <laughs> oh, right, that's where I got it from, because I remember Bugs Bunny and you know, having tea and being like, how many lumps? And then they, they like it. And so he said, wait, what? As I was reading it, and, I, and he said, what did you say? And I said, lumps. And, and I was thinking of sugar cubes, and that's what they were called, and he said, we don't say that, and what that sounds sort of dirty. <laughs> so I thought, oh my goodness, what if I had put in my Looney Tunes informed, you know, assumptions of how British people speak in this book? So he saved me from that. Um, but it was really fun for me to write that character, um, apart from the Britishisms, um, and just uh, the friendship that unfolds between him and these girls, and each each one of them have a different relationship with him. Um, I loved writing the, the squabbles between the girls and the normal you know, tensions that can happen in, in a home. Um, and then Jamila is really tested in, in different ways um, with her friendship with Ali when uh, she makes a, a big mistake actually related to him um, and has to figure out how to fix it um, and also how to be there for her sister when she does develop an illness, um, which is not scarlet fever, um, but another illness. <laughs> so um, she has to figure out how to sort of rein in her temper and, and turn it into something productive um, and how to be there for someone in a way that is actually productive and what they need, which we know isn't always what we think um, they need. So if you like, I can read one more passage. Yeah. So this is um, the other thing about, about my, my books. When I first wrote, um, when I wrote Ominous Voice, I gave it to my mother to read. And she, she's, uh, she, she read about 30 pages. And then I asked her, you know, what do you think? And she said, it's OK. <laughs> she said, it's for children. And I said, well, yes, it's a children's book. And so she read on, and then eventually she, she said she liked it, but she said, you know, you could, you could put some jokes in it. And I said, OK. And if you read um, my Zaid Salim Chasing the Dream series, Nano is my mother, essentially. Um, and so that was the next thing I wrote. And so I tried to make it funny. And I, like, she's a big reason, because she's a, a funny character. Um, and so I gave it to her thinking, all was good. And, and, so, and I also didn't ask my mother for permission to write her. Um, and so I was a little bit nervous when I gave them to her. But she read them. And she found them entertaining. But she said, well, you know, next time you could make something a little juicy. <laughs> and then I realized, like, my mother was talking about romance, which was the weirdest thing for me to ever hear, because I could never talk to my mom about boys. Like, I couldn't mention any, like, the word romance. So I, when I realized that that's what juicy meant, um, I was like, OK. Um, but it's, I don't think, really my, my strength. Um, but when I gave her this book, I said, well, it's a little bit juicy, because <laughs> I thought I was writing romance. But it's the most subtle, probably, you know, hand at romance you'll see. So my mom read it, and then she kept, she kept giving me you know, updates. And she said, I'm reading it, and there's nothing juicy yet. I haven't found anything juicy. Um, but I think it's there. And, and the funny thing is, if you, if you look for it, you find it. Um, if you want to think it's, you know, not there, you can easily avoid it um, <laughs> and, and maybe miss it entirely. So, um, so yeah, so I'm trying to find the chapter that I wanted to read, because this isn't my copy. But this is a little um, taste of what it's like um, in a Pakistani-American home, um, especially when there's any hint of romance. <laughs> um, <clears throat> here it is. 
Mama's lips are pressed together so tight I can barely see them. I didn't say yes, Mariam repeats. Why do you think he could ask you? I don't know. I've never talked to Seth before. We have math together. Mariam twists her long hair into a knot on top of her head. So he surprised you with this out of the blue during math class? Mama looks unconvinced. Not during class. He came up to me afterward. And he presented you someone he's never spoken to before with this elaborate gift? It makes no sense. When I was in high school, no one did anything like this. Mama points to the white box lying on the coffee table. I peer into the box again. There are six jumbo chocolate-covered strawberries inside. But these aren't regular chocolate-covered strawberries. The dark chocolate is decorated with white chocolate lines to look like each berry is wearing a tuxedo. They're adorable. Seth wrote, I'd be very happy if you went to homecoming with me on the lid of the box. Aliza and Bisma cooed over how cute they thought that was. I think it's pretty cute too, even if it's cheesy. He was like, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, yeah. And then he opened up the box and stood there. Mariam changes her voice when she does Seth's part, and I can picture a sweaty, nervous kid fumbling with the box. What did you say, Eliza asks. I think I said something like, oh, wow. I was totally caught off guard. But you took the berries, Mama says? <laughs> what was I supposed to do? Leave them in his hand? That would be so rude, right? Mariam asks. Eliza and Bisma nod enthusiastically in agreement. I hesitate. Yeah, I finally agree. It might have been rude. I understand you didn't want to be rude, but now he thinks you're going with him, Mama asks. I didn't say yes. Mariam's eyes grow bigger. And I don't want to go with him. This is what people do for homecoming now. They do something big when they ask people to go. Girls ask guys, too. I think you should give them back, Mama says. <laughs> no, Eliza pets one of the berries with her finger. They're so cute. Don't touch them, Mama scolds. We should eat them, I say. The chocolate is already starting to slide off the strawberries. The box will be a mess by tomorrow. But you can't keep them, Mama falters. It wouldn't be right. They must have been expensive. It would be so embarrassing if I took them back to school tomorrow. For him. It's not like he can give them to someone else now. Everyone already saw him give them to me. Can I have one, please? Eliza's eyeing the one she touched. Fine, Mama sighs. You probably left a fingerprint on it anyway. Yes, Eliza lifts the berry out of the box and nibbles on the tip. This has to happen when your father isn't here, Mama adds, as if she's thinking aloud. I don't know what you're supposed to do. I think it's a good thing he isn't here for this, Maria mutters under his breath, and our eyes meet for a moment. My parents may not have said too much to us directly about boys yet, but when we were at a wedding last year, a couple of aunties who were known for introducing people for marriage purposes started to ask Mama questions about Mariam, and Baba flipped out. Tell those sharks to stay away from my girls, I remember him fuming at home later that night. Don't they know she's a child? I told you not to let her wear heels. She can pass for 20 when she's done up. <laughs> the next day, he showed us a new gray hair and said he was going to name it Mariam. <laughs> What are you going to say to him? Bisma finally asks what we're all thinking. Baba, Mariam asks. No, Seth. Maybe, thank you, but I'm not allowed to go, Mariam asks. Mama, who nods? Yes, say that you have a very strict mother who forbids you. <laughs> Hearing Mama refer to herself like that in the third person makes Bisma and me giggle. Maybe you could give him a different gift back, Bisma suggests. Yeah, like a big raspberry, I say. Where do you find a big raspberry, Mama asks. <laughs> right here. I stick out my tongue and blow, making a wet fart sound. Everyone starts to laugh, including Mama. Poor Seth, Bisma says, shaking her head when Eliza offers her a strawberry. It was nice of him to ask you. Yeah, it was. Mariam starts to blush, and I'm suddenly impressed by Seth, cheesy pun or not. It took guts to go up to the prettiest girl in the grade, or maybe the entire school, and ask her to the dance. I'm feeling sympathy for this kid when the doorbell rings and startles us. Who's that, Eliza asks. It's Ali, coming over for our interview. I realize he was supposed to be here an hour ago, and he's late. So a little taste of the <laughs> drama that happens around, thank you, um, boys and, oops, here I did it again, sorry. Um, boys and, and dating and something like super awkward, which sort of took me back to the, the Little Women days. and. Um, you know some of the tension around that and, and how you're supposed to do things so um so yeah so that's a bit about the book um i'd love to answer any questions or um things about either this or any any other book if you have some about my other since i know um but i hope you'll read it and enjoy it um well i'm doing revisions to the ominous sequel which um 
We're thinking of Amina's song as the, as the name for that. What do you think? Yes. Does that work? Yes? Oh, okay. Yay, that's a good endorsement. Um, and so um, revisions to that. I'm going to be working with Adam Gidwitz, um, the amazing author of Inquisitor's Tale and, and the Grimm stories. So he has a new series called The Unicorn Rescue Society. And yeah, so I'm going to do, uh, it's so great, right? It's a really fun series. Um, if you haven't seen it. So I'll be doing book six with him for the series and we're gonna start working on that pretty soon. Um, and, and then uh, I have another series that hasn't been announced yet which is um, a, a branching story sort of like, um, I have one back there which is about a mission you take to Mars. So it's a choose your path type story. So um, I'm starting, I, I really love working on books like that. So I'm gonna try to do a few more of those. So that's some of the stuff coming up. But yeah, and some picture books too. So juggling both. Well, for me, the first time I saw myself in a book was actually seeing my mom. Um, and it was weird because they talk about, you know, that shock of recognition or um, what you, when you realize what you miss, you know, when you see it for the first time. And for me, um, it was The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri. And the mother character in that reminded me so much of my mom and what I had heard her, you know, how she described moving to America and, like, how hard it was for her when she first came. And so that was, I think, just shocking for me really to see her um, and so I think what I loved about it was the fact that the culture was just woven in to you know a regular story so for me what I really like to do is um, you know just make it part of life so it's in there you know but you're still dealing with regular kid challenges about you know growing up or fitting in or making friends or navigating life and um, but then that's just part of what their experience is um, and I really was very conscious of not making identity the struggle for my characters um, because I did feel like the few times I did see books with um, diverse characters in them when I was growing up a lot of it was around being uncomfortable with who they were or wishing that they weren't different or resenting their family or their culture for being different and and then maybe coming to terms with that and coming to accept that but um, I, I didn't want to write that. So for me, all my characters, you know, they may have share a background similar to me, but that's not their challenge. Um, it's, you know, other life stuff and it's just who they, and of course, like, they get embarrassed by things that, you know, like anybody does. Um, but it's not, oh, why am I Pakistani American or why am I Muslim or, um, you know, why can't I be X, Y, Z? So for me, that's, that's, I hope my contribution because, um, yeah, I didn't want to write books that were overly issue, issue laden or, like I said, driven by identity. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've made 12 books so far that are my own books, like these that I published on myself. I mean, with help, but by my, I mean my my books. And then I also, when I started writing books for kids, I worked with Scholastic Book Clubs, and I wrote for a bunch of their series. So if you add those books in, which I don't usually count, it would be more like around 20. But I have 12 of my own. I did not. So the illustrator for the cover is actually the same illustrator who did Amina's voice. Um, I don't know if you can tell this. The style sort of similar with. The, the details. Um, so yeah, she, I think she I think she did a really beautiful job, um, and she's doing the cover for the sequel as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think she's really talented. But unfortunately, I don't have the artistic skills to illustrate any of my books. <laughs> it would just be stick figures if it was me. Um, but I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Well, Amina's Voice was the first book that they pop. It was like it launched this new imprint, and I didn't know it when I sold it to uh, my editor. So she was with she was at Simon and Schuster, and she was you know, editing and publishing other books. And so um, she had said she was interested in purchasing the book um, after, you know, I'd gotten tons of rejections. And she had actually initially rejected it as well. But she gave me a very soft rejection. And it was sort of like, come back if you don't sell this to someone else. <laughs> um, and I ended up having to rewrite it um, by, and the story didn't change. But what was, I couldn't understand what was wrong with it. Um, until I had a little distance from it. And I had a writing group that was able to pinpoint what was missing was, we call it agency, but I didn't give my character enough of a, a motive um, in my story. So it was a very subtle switch that I made. I made Amina want to sing in the competition. Initially I had her sort of just reacting to everything and everyone else wanting what everyone else wanted for her. Um, but as I was trying to do that, I ended up rewriting it in the first person voice. I had originally written it in the third person. And nothing else really changed. Um, and then, and then Zareen bought it. 
but the announcement about Salam Reads was embargoed, so she couldn't tell me, <laughs> and um, because the New York Times was going to be announcing it, it was this big deal. So um, she said, "I have some exciting news I can't share with you yet," <laughs> and I said, "What could that be? I had no idea." Um, and then I heard about Salam Reads and was so excited. So basically, it's a you know new imprint or division of of Simon Schuster, not so new now, like two years old, um, and it's focusing on books about Muslims by Muslims um, of all different backgrounds. And what I love about it is that it's really um, trying, or her goal is to really represent a lot of the diversity that exists within the Muslim community. Um, and she has like a, for example, a Malaysian author who just wrote a YA and she's trying, she's just trying to find voices that haven't been heard. And even though Muslim voices in general haven't been heard, the few that have been heard um, are predominantly South Asian like me um, and some Arab, you know, Arab voices, but we don't see a lot of other communities. So um, I really appreciate her commitment to that. Thank you all again for coming. I really, really appreciate it. It means a lot to me, um, and I hope we'll meet again sometime. And good luck. With